month, he and his brother, Hunter Nade, have hosted the APP podcast, which is average in age of listeners of the age of 27 years old. Is that not awesome? Yeah. He is also the VP of economics for the APP, and with his keen interest and wit and bright mind, he offers so much perspective to the Alberta Prosperity Project. And he's here to demonstrate the many merits and benefits of a free and prosperous Alberta. Here with an economic forecast for an independent nation of Alberta, Mr. Tanner Nade. From the, well, from the Ellis Dawn Construction Company on Twitter, I have a quote, just recent. Here is what it says. The world's largest cricket production facility is officially complete. Aspire Food Group's new plant in London, Ontario is ready to produce 9,000 metric tons of crickets annually for human and pet consumption. End quote. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> and so, and so my reply to that is, yeah, no thank you, right? The WEF can chomp on crickets and those federal politicians pushing a Green New Deal should be required to chomp on those crickets, but we're going to stick to eating Alberta beef. And I am absolutely certain that you will agree with me when I say that Alberta farmers, Alberta ranchers, and Alberta beef is the emblem and the anthem of the free and prosperous Alberta of enough. Our production and consumption of Alberta beef, our famous production, our prodigious consumption, is an accurate thermometer taking the temperature of the rights and freedoms and overall well-being in the country. I mean that insofar as beef is both a practical symbol and a stern declaration to the rest of the world that we are a, a free and an industrious nation. Both the quantity and the quality of the beef that we produce and consume is something that, for the whole of history, only the most privileged and free of people could ever enjoy. In this, for decades on decades on decades, the policy of not only Alberta, but even Canada as well, has been to promote the strongest, healthiest, most flavorful, most impressive beef on the continent. But you are undoubtedly aware that there is a faction in the federal bureaucracy in Ottawa who, after watching us prosper and be blessed with these sorts of foods we are so happy to provide and that our families are so happy to consume and enjoy, have been stricken with a compunction of conscience. They have heard a voice, an ominous voice, and a commanding voice, echoed in these great halls at summits at Davos and Geneva and Glasgow where the shadows of new conditioners cower over the politicians they control. And what has that voice said? What has that voice told us? Quote, You will be eating replacement meats within 20 years. Here's why. That is a quote, it's a title, from an article from the WEF. So Ottawa has decided we should no longer eat beef. They are ruling it is no longer safe to do so. Health Canada has decided that ground meats with a higher concentration of saturated fats than whole cut meats must soon be brandished with a warning label as if we're purchasing a product that might lead to our doom. But I wonder if those same foods, all those packaged and processed items, cookies and cakes and chips and your, and your mother-in-law's casserole will require a warning label as well. <laughs> the, ca the casserole might, but the rest, as you know, <laughs> will not. 
I also wonder if this prophesied legislation or rules and this anti-beef agenda will economically devastate the producers of cattle and the consumers of beef, not only in our province, but in the country of Canada as well. It will. It will. The grocery store is a bastion of capitalism. Compare those shelves that we shop from to socialist nations where the shelves are bare and malnourished. It is our high privilege to be able to choose what foods we want to consume for our weekly meals. And when we shop for groceries, we engage in a sort of game that we often take for granted. But of course, competition must be fair. There cannot be, granted to the few, unfair advantages that entice otherwise neutral consumers to purchase one product over another. That's wrong. But if this mandate with beef passes, putting warning labels on beef, if that passes, and make no mistake, it will pass. Two choices will stare at you in the face at the meat section of the grocery aisle. Chicken, without a warning label, and beef, with a warning label. Immediately, the cattle producer and his production is put at a serious disadvantage. His product, competing with substitutes like chicken or pork or what have you, is at once demoted to the bracket of the dangerous and is unfairly discriminated against as something we should be cautious to consume. But don't stop there. Expect also a beef tax. Expect incentives to dissuade us from eating what once we enjoy. Brace yourselves for more inflation as the price of groceries continues to rise. Of course, all of these things will contribute to higher beef prices and, when combined, will conjure a monstrous storm that will elevate beef prices so high, I imagine it will emancipate beef from our menu consideration altogether. But none of these things, in my opinion, will so contribute to the price of beef like the mysterious mass destruction of packing plants across the continent. Does anyone remember the, uh, the story of Joseph? Seven years of harvest, said the Lord, followed by seven years of famine. Save up your grain. Right now was the vision in preparation for the desolation that was to come. So, Cargill and JBS with uh, three pack packing plants across the country, one in High River, as you know, one in Brooks, massive, and uh, one in Gulf, Ontario, process 95% plus of all the beef in Canada. Now, I am not so concerned with their efficiency. Right? Economies of scale and minimal average cost means that those companies and those packing plants are efficient. That's true. That isn't negotiable. It's not debatable. It's a fact. Those countries are efficient. And as long as producers and feedlots are able to export their livestock to the U.S. for slaughter, the market power of those packers and those processors in Canada is restrained, at least to some capacity. But again, that is not my present concern. My concern, and your concern, right now is a concern regarding resiliency. What happens to the present capacity, or if the present capacity, for meat plaque packing is not only diminished, but destroyed. Look at the situation down south. February 5th, Wisconsin River Meats Processing Facility destroyed by fire, Wisconsin. February 15th, Bonanza Meat Company goes up in flames, Texas. February 22nd, Shearer's Food Processing Plant explodes, Oregon. February 22nd, fire destroys Delhi Star Meat Plant, Illinois. March 17th, Nestle Food Plant extensively damaged in fire and new production destroyed, Arkansas. I have two pages of this, 90 reported destructions in America in 2022 alone for packing and distribution centers. Do you believe that's a coincidence? <laughs> Do you think the cricket facility in Ontario is going to go up in flames as well? <laughs> what is the end game? What is the goal? 
If we do nothing, I am forecasting the abolition of the meat industry in our beloved province of Alberta. I am telling you, not as a conspiracy theorist and not as a fear monger, but as a servant of reality, that these strategic shortages of protein are planned. Now, just a few years ago, it would have seemed like madness to forecast such a thing, but today, it seems like madness not to do so. Which, considering that there are 18,000 beef producers in Alberta, 60,000 plus in Canada, all contributing $21.8 billion to the GDP at market prices, and $11.7 billion in labor income, and some 347,000 full-time equivalent jobs, it's a serious consideration to make. But here we have an opportunity before us that has never been and perhaps never will be again. Now is the time for our province to consider the wisdom of Joseph and build up a resiliency in the beef market in order to ensure that 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, we're fed, our parents are fed, our spouses are fed, and our children never go hungry. So, to do this, the very first thing the APP proposes is to rip that warning label off every single package of beef that our province produces. And then, you incinerate that label along with every socialist policy that our current government adopts so that we, as APP and Albertans, might declare absolute and total support for Alberta farmers, Alberta ranchers, Alberta consumers, and Alberta beef. Simultaneously, we must, both in fearless courage and in bravery, publicly issue a decree, as far as I'm concerned, to the WEF and global powers that are, that Alberta is not and never will be a pawn or a servant in their ideological dystopia, and that Alberta will not and never will conform to their humanist ideal of a society that mimics something out of Brave New World or 1984. Put simply, Global powers tell us we're not going to eat Alberta beef, and our reply is that we're going to keep eating Alberta beef. <laughs> Finally, resiliency. We have so many federal laws and regulations that make it impossible for an individual to slaughter and sell a cow properly. The big corporations, efficient though they might be, can handle that burden precisely because they're massive. The federal rules are massive and so only the massive businesses can take them on. Of course, the niche and local packer cannot. The APP is therefore proposing that an independent Alberta abolish these invasive and often very useless standards and deregulate in order to free up the market so that if an individual in a community or if a community wants to begin processing cattle, they or he or she is free to do so without the all-seeing eye of big government watching their every move. On the one hand, the federal government has a lust to change our way of life in a manner that has never been seen in Canadian history. On the other hand, we are a dignified resistance of Albertans who have a resolve to oppose their advance. Those who want us to no longer eat beef are led by a handful of desperados. We, on the other hand, are led by individual Albertans, those who cherish and want to protect our rights and freedoms. This movement grows, and it continues to grow. Federal domination, or their attempted domination, of our nation is at an end as we grow tired of their trying to submerge us in a way of life that we will not accept. And when we are successful, when we have that referendum on independence, and when we enjoy independence itself, then we shall be protected from economic destruction. Then our children shall be shielded from the terrors of wokeism. And then our province, a public beacon of resolute defiance against this new order, shall stand in the world as a nation that is sovereign and prosperous and free. Well, we get 